Hello everyone and welcome to another Keep Safe on the Net video on YouTube. This story is a little different from the stories I usually tell on Keep Safe on the Net. Usually when I wind up scammers it's people asking for a few hundred dollars, usually via iTunes or Western Union or one of the cash apps. But this story is a bit more serious. It involves three continents, Europe, Africa and the USA, and it involves a money mule. What happened took me by surprise, it wasn't what I was expecting, but I'm telling the story as a warning to all my viewers. What is a money mule? Let's start by looking at what is a money mule, how they're recruited, and what part they play in international crime. The Europol website defines money muling as a type of money laundering. It says a money mule is a person who receives money from a third party in their bank account and transfers it to another one. It goes on to say that even if money mules are not directly involved in the crimes that generate the money, they are accomplices as they launder the proceeds of such crimes. Simply put, money mules help criminal syndicates to remain anonymous while moving funds around the world. How are these money mules recruited? Europol helps us again. They're recruited through seemingly legitimate job offers, usually for money transfer agents. And according to Europol, these are announced via online job forums, emails, social media or pop-up ads. I'd add that they often appear on sites such as Craigslist. I've personally received several of these fake job offers over the years. And again, Europol helps us by telling us some of the characteristics of these fake job offers. They tell us that Money Mule adverts normally state that they are an overseas company and that they're looking for agents to receive money from third parties overseas and transfer it to avoid taxes and fees. They usually tell you that you can make something like $1,000 a week for very little work. Anyone tempted by these offers of easy money should know that no company anywhere ever needs to recruit online agents to receive money on their behalf and transfer it on. This is never a legitimate activity and it always involves laundering the proceeds of crimes. And now the story of what happened. I follow a celebrity musician on Facebook. Just recently, a friend alerted me that a fake account had been set up in this musician's name. This fake profile was replying to women who were commenting on this musician's threads asking the women to message him privately. So my online alter ego messaged this fake profile. Annie told him that she'd been a supporter of his work for several years, and he asked her which of his songs was her favourite. He thanked her for her love and support, and asked which of his shows she'd been to. Then he told her that it was his dream to bring smiles to the faces of others through my music, and Annie assured him she was one of his greatest fans. The conversation quickly moved to Hangouts, where Annie was told not to share his Gmail with anyone, not even a close friend. This is a typical tactic used by scammers who try to gain their victim's confidence and try to ensure that they don't tell anyone that they're talking to the scammer. The scammer doesn't want any of the victim's friends or family to realise what's happening and try to stop them talking to each other. Then he started asking Annie lots of personal questions, such as, are you married? Do you have kids? Do you have siblings? Annie told him she was divorced, that she didn't have children, that she had two brothers and that she lived with her elderly mother, and then asked about him. He said, I'm married and I have kids, but you seem to be a nice woman and every man would love to have you as a wife. Annie was flattered by that and said, could I come and visit you? And he replied, if you wish to, but I live with my family. So Annie said, oh, perhaps I shouldn't then. And he said, I would say you're a great fan. And Annie agreed, yes, I am. A characteristic of a lot of these scammers is that every time there's a break in the conversation, they will come back to you and ask you a question or make a comment that seems to be completely unrelated to anything that went before. You can see here that after Annie had said she was his great fan, there was a break and then suddenly the scammer came back and said, well, very soon, which didn't appear to relate to anything that had been said before and then said, how are you? How has life been with you? And then asked her what she did for a living. He spent a lot of time trying to get to know her, 
asking her all sorts of questions, including what was her favourite colour, what were her favourite movies or actors, and what did she love doing the most. General questions to make him sound interested in her as a person and to gain her confidence so that he could start using her as a victim. Then the next day, he started the conversation by saying, can I ask you a question? So Annie said, of course you can. And he said, how old are you? So Annie told him she was 50. And he said, OK, good. I'm feeling so down right now and I need someone to talk to. I need someone to tell me about my life. I really don't know what to do. So Annie asked him what was wrong. She said, you can tell me. I promise I won't tell anyone. And he said, I'm feeling so down right now. I caught my wife having an affair with another man. I tried confronting her, but she stood and said she's never loved me and that she got married to me because of my money and fame. It's really hurt me a lot because I don't think we still have good women out there anymore. I've been receiving different reports from my friends that they always see my wife with a different man, but I never believed them until I saw it with my eyes. I'm still in deep shock. I am hurt right now. Ah, oh, poor thing. And this is how the scammers try to gain the confidence of their victims. Here, the scammer believed he was talking to a genuine fan of a celebrity, a fan who was probably starstruck and very flattered that the celebrity was taking a personal interest in her and confiding in her. He told Annie how upset and hurt he was and how he needed a woman who would love me for who I am and not because of my money. Annie told him she understood that it must be really hard for him and he said, I don't think I will ever get a good woman out there anymore. Annie thought that was really sad and reassured him that she didn't need his money. She had plenty of money of her own from her divorce and she also had a good job. So she asked if there was any way that she could help him and would he like to come and stay with her for a while. He said he'd love to come and see her but his wife had filed for divorce and he needed to get everything sorted before he could come. Annie told him she knew how horrible divorce could be because she'd been through one herself and he said she didn't need to be afraid because he has the best attorney in town so he was sure that everything would be fine. A little while later he asked her how her divorce went and then started asking how much money she'd got from the divorce and what kind of house she wanted. So Annie told him that the houses that she was looking for were up to 750,000. Notice that he'd mentioned 200,000. He told her he was going to court next week and then asked her to send him a beautiful picture of herself. He carried on chatting to Annie, asking her several personal questions then asking her if she had any top secret you wished to tell a close friend, saying, I'm very sure I'm your closest friend now. Still fishing for information, he asked Annie what kind of phone she was using, did she ever think of falling in love again, and what kind of job she had. Immediately after that, he asked Annie what would she say if I said I've started developing feelings for you right now. Love is a crazy thing and it can happen to anybody. He asked her if she'd like to come and see him some day so that they could spend time together. And of course, Annie said yes, she would. And then he told her that he had houses in almost all the countries. I have about 57 houses, he said, but I have people who take care of them. Believing that he was talking to a genuine potential victim, he then started sending hearts and kisses and flowers and other emojis. Watch out for this. If the person that you're chatting to online suddenly start sending you ridiculous amounts of love emojis, there's a fairly high chance that you're talking to a scammer. He carried on chatting to Annie and then told her that he wanted a special name for her. She said that was okay, so he said he would call her Cupcake. Aww. A while later, he asked Annie for her address, saying that he wanted to send her a present. So Annie sent him a made-up address using a Scottish postcode. She explained that it was her cousin's address and that all her parcels were sent there because her mother was too nosy and as he'd asked her not to tell anyone about the relationship between himself and Annie, the parcel had to go to her cousin who would then forward it so it appeared to come from her. At this point, it hadn't occurred to me that anyone was actually going to try and deliver anything. I just assumed that the scammer was fishing for more information. Then he started trying to get Annie to give him her phone number. So she gave him the number of an online service that can be used for receiving texts. He said he needed the number because they want to deliver the present to you, they would call you. 
and also said he needed the name of her city and counting. I think he meant county. He continued trying to get Annie's own home address and continued to tell her not to tell anyone about them, trying to make sure that she didn't tell any of her friends or family so that nobody could warn her that she was talking to a scammer. Once again, he asked her for her county, so she told him that her cousin lived in East Kilbride. So yet again, he asked her if the address that she'd given him was her cousin's address, and Annie replied rather tetchily that she'd told him that a few times. Then he went back to fishing for more information, once again asking her what kind of phone she was using, and this time asking her what kind of laptop. For the avoidance of doubt, I don't actually own a Dell computer. And he carried on pressing Annie to tell him what kind of phone she was using. And then when Annie told him she didn't use her phone very much because the screen was too small, he offered to buy her a new one. Then he asked Annie if they could have children together and then said that after his divorce he just wanted to come over to be with her and then asked if she knew of a hotel with good security and, of course, continued to tell her how much he loved her. Telling her that he would be going to court by Wednesday for his divorce and that he would book a flight to come over to be with her the following Monday. Then he told Annie that the present he'd promised her would be delivered by 5pm that day and again asked her, do not tell anyone it's me babe as promised and said to her, honey, I sent it through someone. You don't have to be worried. They will be there by 5pm. Then I think he was testing Annie to see if the information that she was giving him was real because he asked if she'd heard from her cousin today. That gave me a bit of a dilemma because I couldn't say I'd received a parcel that I hadn't received, because he would have asked me about what was in it, and I didn't know whether or not he'd actually sent anything. So I only told him that her cousin had received three parcels that day. She wanted to open them and send them all on in one box, so she asked him what his present was. He said he'd sent her a sweet flower, and Annie said her cousin hadn't mentioned flowers, but she would ask her again tomorrow. It seems that I was right not to pretend that I'd received something that I hadn't. Because when I told him the next day that my cousin had opened the parcels and that there weren't any flowers, he said, Honey, maybe that's not what I sent, but you will get mine today. What happened next is when this scam started taking me by surprise. Late afternoon that day, I received a message saying, Honey, I am just angry right now. The address you gave me is not correct. The person that wants to deliver it has been going round London but cannot locate your address. He has been really angry. I don't think you need to be a geography specialist to realise that you aren't going to find East Kilbride in Scotland in London. So Annie said, London? Question mark, question mark, question mark. My cousin lives in East Kilbride in Scotland. Never mind, your friend can give it to you when you come here. He then started on what turned out to be probably dozens of repetitions of the address, trying to get me to reconfirm it, saying, Honey, let me explain this to you. I paid him about $5,000 to deliver the present to you. So rather facetiously, Annie then said, Then he can fly up to Scotland or go first class on the train. He said, Yes, babe, on the train, because I paid him. Do you understand now, babe? And then there were two more repetitions of the address, trying to get Annie to reconfirm it. And Annie said, no, I don't understand. Why pay someone a huge amount of money to deliver something you can bring yourself? Sounds daft to me. He carried on chatting until about three hours later, when he suddenly said, honey, please, he is outside. Just say it is correct. He'd made about four further attempts to get Annie to reconfirm the address. Annie told him that whoever his friend is, he's lying. He simply can't have travelled from London to Scotland since we last spoke. He said, honey, please stop saying that. He works in a delivery company. I'm not a child, babe. Just leave everything for me, babe. Honey, the address is correct, right? Making yet a further attempt to get Annie to reconfirm the address. So Annie told him again that his friend was lying, saying that it isn't possible. I think he's stolen your money. He didn't like that and said, Honey, you don't have to say that. Why don't you want to obey what I say, babe? Annie thought of getting into a debate with him and telling him off for telling her to obey him, but decided against it. The following morning, he carried on making small talk, sending Annie lots more heart emojis, 
and making two further attempts to get her to reconfirm the address. Then she received this message. It said, is your cousin's house close to a community hall? Please, babe, get back to me now. The deliver is around the community hall. Is it around or is it in? And he named a street. Please, babe, I need your response now. It's urgent. And then he tried calling me on Hangouts. In fact, he tried calling me twice. I didn't cut off the call. I was probably in the kitchen. So Annie told him that her cousin had just rung to say that there'd been an outbreak of the new South African strain of the virus locally. So she wouldn't answer the door to anyone and she wouldn't touch anything if it was delivered. And then, over a week into this scam, he started fishing to see whether he might be able to get money from Annie. Asking her if she had the money to book for the hotel before he came. Annie told him that he didn't need to pay until he got here. But he said, if you don't, please tell me, babe. Let me know what to do. Honey, I want you to pay for the room. I don't want any obstacles or distractions when I come there. So Annie said, OK. And then came the day of his divorce hearing. I wonder if you can guess what happened. Because I did. Yes, you guessed it. It all went horribly wrong and his wife claimed everything. He said he'd put all the property in her name and had even put her in charge of their foundation. He told Annie he'd paid a huge amount of money to the court so that they wouldn't let the general public or the press know about the divorce. He said his account had been blocked and he needed money to pay for the court case. He said he needed £15,000. He didn't have the full amount and asked Annie if she could pay £7,000. Annie said of course she'd help him and he said that he would send her the data where you will send my attorney the money. Thank you very much, babe. And he said, I will send back the money to you as soon as possible. My flight is still Monday. I will settle everything before I come, babe. And this is where our money mule joins the story. He sent Annie the details of an American bank account. And he found this person online on social media. We had a long conversation, most of which I won't reproduce here because money mules can also be viewed as victims. This person told Annie that their brother had also been scammed in the past, and Annie pointed out that the scammers are clever and they know how to be believable and make people fall for their tricks. It seems that this person was either desperate for money or had genuinely been taken in by the charms of this scammer. Because the next thing that happened is that I received this message from the scammer, asking me why I'd messaged his attorney's secretary to say the account was a scam. And then he got the first of many attacks of verbal diarrhoea, asking why I'd been pretending to love him, telling me just how down he was, does it mean all women are the same, I'm just so confused right now. Annie stopped answering him, but he continued, telling her he was going to cancel his flight, saying, I have never wronged you, but you hurt my life. Honey, I know you don't want to help me, that's why you're bringing a third party into this conversation. If you were in my position, I would have helped you without excitation. It's so painful that I've fallen for you. I thought you loved me. You've been playing with my heart. And so he carried on, playing the heartbroken victim, until finally, at quarter past five on the 6th of February, he sent the last message, saying it's so painful how heartless you are. So you're truly a scam. You're not who you say you are. It's so painful you pretended to be someone else. You're heartless. I guess he really was desperate for that £7,000 he tried to steal. At the start, I said this story spanned three continents, Europe, Africa and America. But why did I say that? We know the money mule is in America because of the details he gave me. Early on in the scam, I pulled a trick on our scammer, which told me that he was in Lagos in Nigeria. And it seems to me that the scammer had contacts in the UK who were trying to deliver something in London and in Scotland, or at least trying to verify that the address that I had given the scammer existed. Although the scammer initially asked for £7,000, I'm quite certain that had I paid that, he would have continued asking for increasing sums of money until he'd taken every penny that I had, because that's exactly what the scammers do to their victims. They have no shame, and they will take as much money as the victims are prepared to send them. This story contains all the hallmarks of a classic long-term scam, repeatedly telling the victim not to tell anyone that they're talking to the scammer. Days spent exchanging messages trying to gain the victim's confidence, 
telling the victim how much they love them, sending repeated messages with hearts and other emojis, trying to make the victim believe that the scammer is genuinely falling in love with them. And then finally, at some stage, the requests for money. And these requests will continue with increasing excuses for as long as the victim is prepared to send money. So please share this story with your friends, your family and anyone that you know that might be vulnerable. All the classic signs of a scam are in here. And I want to use this story to try to prevent others from falling victim. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, please like it, please share it, please subscribe to my channel and I'll see you again in another Keep Safe on the Net video on YouTube.